right, everybody, we're going to talk about some of the GI bugs here, which generally are going to manifest as a diarrhea. So there are a lot of GI bugs, um, but on the exam, when we're talking about infections of the gastrointestinal tract, we're talking about an acute diarrhea. Obviously, there are other infections. You know, Helicobacter pylori is technically an infection of the stomach and cause ulcers, uh, but we're going to be focusing on the bugs that cause infectious diarrhea. And here, we're really talking about acute diarrhea. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can do it by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the I button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I very much thank all those of you who have already donated. I appreciate it very much. And certainly subscribe to my channel and you'll get updates and notifications as I put more and more videos up. All right, so uh, as I said, the major infections of the GI tract are pretty much limited to foodborne illnesses and acute diarrhea. Now, all patients with acute diarrhea should first be carefully evaluated for volume status. Remember our ABCs. So we're always looking at volume status because remember that these patients are losing a lot of fluid in the diarrhea, depending on how severe it is. Now, um, obviously a very mild self-limited Campylobacter diarrhea, you're probably gonna be okay, but cholera on the other hand, not so much. Uh, so it's generally a good idea to give these patients a bolus of normal saline when they come in because a lot of these patients will be dehydrated um, unless there are significant factors like renal issues that may contraindicate fluid administration. It's also a good idea to get electrolytes and CBC um, to kind of have these baseline labs as you start out. Um, you really want to look, especially at that BMP, because they may have electrolyte derangements with this ongoing diarrhea, depending on how severe it is. So the first question you want to ask yourself when you have a patient coming in with acute diarrhea, which, by the way, is less than two weeks of duration, is, is it bloody? The best initial diagnostic step when you've got a patient with acute diarrhea is stool studies. Lactoferrin, which measures white blood cells, and then red blood cells, fecal fat, ovum parasites, that'll give you a really good idea of what you're dealing with. The most accurate test to figure out the cause of an infectious diarrhea, anytime you have an infection, it's always going to be culture. It's always the most accurate test. Do we do it on everyone? Absolutely not. This is a good algorithm here. They put acute diarrhea less than seven days, but most um, describe acute diarrhea as less than two weeks. So they'll ask um, whether the following are present. What these are really getting to is how severe is this? Okay, if none of these are present, uh, then really we just treat this symptomatically. You can give them antidiarrheal agents. Really what we're just looking at here is replace fluids. Almost all of these are self-limited, so we don't need to use antibiotics or anything. As long as the patient is otherwise healthy, it's just the diarrhea, we're fine. Now, if the diarrhea persists despite no therapy, or they have these severe factors present, so severe fever, 38.5 Celsius for all my American friends is 103 degrees Fahrenheit, if they have significant abdominal pain, uh, if they have significant bloody diarrhea, if they're immune compromised, or if they're older than 70, we want to really work them up and get to what the cause is. So that's where you get the fecal leukocytes, uh, you'll get the, uh, the culture, uh, you want to do a C. difficile if they were recently hospitalized or have been on antibiotics within the, within the last few weeks, and then the ova and parasite testing. Uh, depending on a variety of factors, the duration, their travel history. Um, again, they uh, put this men who have sex with men. I don't like this because what they're getting at here is fecal, well, I should say uh, anal, oral, sexual contact. That is not limited to men who have sex with men. There are plenty of opposite sex couples or you know heterosexual oriented people who engage in analingus. So Get that out of your mind right now, okay? You can be a man who has sex with women or a woman who has sex with men or a woman who has sex with women, and you can get this, okay? You can get any of these causes of, of fecal oral transmission. So that's, that's important for you to remember. Um, now, when would we do empiric antibiotic therapy? It's generally when we have severe disease. We'll get to that. 
So these are all your causes of bloody diarrhea, also ca called dysentery. Um, now, one of the ways that you can tell you've got white blood cells is a positive lactoferrin test, um, but that's kind of complicated. I'll get to why that is in a little bit. So a variety of causes, what I put here is the association. So that'll help you on your test. So salmonella is associated with poultry and eggs. Shigella is associated with reactive arthritis. So they get, they get a diarrheal illness, it, they recover, and then they start having joint pain. Campylobacter is associated with the development of Guillain-Barre syndrome, so they have diarrhea, and then they go on to develop ascending paralysis a few weeks later. Yersinia is associated with contaminated animal products and vegetables. E. coli 0157H7 is famously associated with the development of hemolytic uremic syndrome, so look for disturbed, liver, or disturbed renal function, um, look for uh, hemolysis, um, and uh, thrombocytopenia even. Uh, C. diff is, of course, associated with recent antibiotic use, very foul-smelling stools. I have never smelt a stool that I would put in a candle, um, but uh, often nurses, because they spend so much time with patients, they've got a nose for this. Uh, so ask your nurses. They are your friends. Entamoeba histolytica, also called amoebiasis, is associated with travel to endemic areas and oral anal sexual contact. Vibrio vulnificus is associated with liver disease. They're at higher risk, and they may have skin findings. This is associated with shellfish consumption. Um, it grows in brackish waters, fresh waters. Vibrio parahemolyticus is associated with seafood. And then CMV diarrhea is associated with immunocompromised people. One of the giveaways here is they may tell you they did a colonoscopy, and they found intestinal ulcerations. CMV diarrhea can also be non-bloody. These are the skin manifestations that you can see in Vibrio vulnificus. Now, the non-bloody diarrhea is far and away the number one cause is viral infections. I'm, I'm talking here about norovirus, which is going to be in small children, and the, um, I'm sorry, Norwalk virus is associated with adults and older children, whereas the rotavirus is associated with small children. So rotavirus is small children. And the way that I remember that is Norwalk is in people who can walk. So, you know, older than two. So remember that. Okay, Staph aureus is associated with vomiting and dairy products. B. serious is associated with vomiting and reheated fried rice. Now, that's the classic vignette, but that's not the only way it can happen. Staph aureus and B. serious are very, very, very fast. It comes on fast, goes away fast. We're talking one or two days. So often these patients don't even make it to the doctor and they're already recovered. C. perfringens is almost always associated with improperly refrigerated meat. Listeria is deli meats and really anything you can get in the deli, cheeses and stuff like that. Uh, again, this is generally self-limited, but this can be a really, really big problem if you're pregnant and you get it. So for that reason, we generally advise pregnant women to avoid uh, cold cuts. ETEC is the cause of traveler's diarrhea. So look for a patient who's gone to Mexico or Guatemala or Brazil or you know, India uh, in places where uh, sanitation may not be the best. Giardia is associated with campers, oral anal sexual contact. These patients get a severe bloating and flatus because this is a malabsorptive diarrhea. Um, so look for you know, all those signs of malabsorption. They're gonna have a positive fecal fat, um, ova and parasites naturally because this is parasitic. Um, and you can also get a Giardia antigen if you really wanna be specific. Cryptosporidium is usually going to happen in patients with full-blown AIDS, uh, CD4 count less than 100. Um, there are tests you can do. You can get a cryptosporidium antigen test or a modified acid fasting. Either of those are fine. Um, but the big thing here is that one of the major components of treatment uh, is going to be to get these patients up, They're, get their CD4 counts up, and that means heart therapy, anti, uh, the antiretrovirals, right? 
Uh, Vibrio cholera is cholera, and that causes a voluminous rice water diarrhea. These patients are all, almost always in endemic areas. Maybe you get a traveler, uh, but this is not something we run into in the U.S. And then scombroid poisoning. Uh, this is not really a diarrhea. It is a foodborne illness. Um, within 10 minutes of eating certain fish, tuna, mackerel, they're going to get these allergic features. So they'll get, they'll break out in hives. They may get an enlarged tongue and all that stuff. Diarrhea is not the salient symptom here because within about 10 minutes, they're going to be getting these allergic symptoms. This is the scombroid reaction that you may see in those patients. So the treatment is generally nothing. It's supportive. We replace the fluids, tell them to drink Pedialyte, come back in a few days if you're not better. Uh, generally self-limited. Ensure adequate hydration and electrolytes. However, if they are very ill or they're immunocompromised, we will treat them empirically with a fluoroquinolone, and that tends to be ciprofloxacin. We only give antidiarrheal agents if they have mild cases of non-bloody diarrhea. Okay, that's the only time we do it. We do not give antidiarrheal agents to bloody diarrhea. We don't give it to uh, people who are really sick. Uh, we only give it to healthy people with non-bloody diarrhea. The specific treatment uh, is going to depend on presumption or the culture. So if they have giardiasis, camper with uh, non-bloody voluminous fatty diarrhea, we can give tinidazole or nitazoxanide. We used to give metronidazole, not anymore, too much resistance. So tinidazole or nitazoxanide. Campylobacter, uh, we usually go for azithromycin. Cryptosporidiosis, remember these are typically AIDS patients. Make sure they're on proper heart. Because this is uh, parasitic, we would give nitazoxanide, similar to with giardiasis. C. diff, vancomycin, PO. Uh, you can do, uh, you can do uh, clindamycin and flagell uh, if they don't respond to vancomycin. Listeria is simple. It's amoxicillin. Scombroid poisoning, it's not any kind of antibiotic. It's just antihistamines to help with the allergic symptoms. When do we admit? Here's when we admit. Big ones, signs of sepsis, severe dehydration, or they're uh, worsening or if they have any kind of uh, symptoms uh, that are concerning for complications, like severe, severe abdominal pain. Um, and then obviously, if they are immunocompromised or if they have signs of hemolytic uremic syndrome. And what does that co come from? E. coli 0157H7, that is a common test question. Some notes for CCS. This is why I said that whole lactoferrin is complicated. So I... Because I love you guys so much, I went and did my research on CCS to see all the, you know, tests you can order. And lactoferrin is not on there, nor is fecal leukocytes. Um, so in real life, you got to remember to do that. Uh, but uh, all these other things are on there. So very important. You can't just order stool studies. Uh, you can't just type in stool study and have that be one order. You have to order all of these individually. So ova and parasites. Uh, culture and sensitivity, fat stain, and then any of the PCR or antigen or toxin tests that you may suspect. So you got a camper with fatty diarrhea, giardia, recently hospitalized person or antibiotics, C. diff. Um, you can also do Vibrio and Shigatoxin.